So we've talked about microevolution as sort of changes in allele and genotypic frequencies and populations over time. That's causing a population to go out of this thing called Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And it can be caused by natural selection, drift, gene flow, mutation, non-random mating. And how these microevolutionary processes over lots of time and many, many gen generations can leave, lead to macroevolutionary processes. So large scale evolution over long periods of time and ultimately lead to speciation. Where you have one population or initially something that was one population of one species somewhere in the past getting split and diverging so much by these microevolutionary processes that eventually you have two different species. So we're gonna continue by talking about species definitions and we're also gonna talk about phylogeny and phylogenetic trees. So there's a couple different species concepts is what we call them or different ways that you can define a species or identify a species. One of the first is something called the morpho species concept. So remember morpho is like morphology. Morphology is like your physical appearance. So this is basically just looking at the physical appearance of organisms and using that to define one species versus another based on morphological differences or differences in their appearance. So like a cat and a dog, they look very different. So we're gonna say these things are different enough or they look different enough that we're gonna call them different species. And obviously that's relatively easy to use, especially when you have species that look very different from one another. The downside of using this morpho species concept is it can be very subjective in the types of characters that you use to define one species versus another. And it's oftentimes very difficult when you have cryptic or polymorphic species. So when I say cryptic species, what I mean is for example, these moths that you're looking at down here, these represent 16 different species of moths, okay? And what you can see is they're very, very, very similar looking and you need to really be an expert on moths and moth mortho morphology to be able to call these different species. And you can also have what's called polymorphic species. So with polymorphic species, for example, a dog, you can have individuals that are all members of the same species. They're all capable of interbreeding. But if you know you were from another planet and you've never seen a dog before and you saw a pug versus a Great Dane, you'd almost certainly, based just on morphology, say these must be different species, right? And we see this not just in dogs that are sort of artificially selected for crazy character traits, but we also see this in the wild too. So these frogs that you're looking at right here, these are all one species. They are strawberry poison dart frogs. The genus and species is Oophago pamilio, and they have all of these different color morphs. But once again, this is all one species. So if you use just that morphological species concept, you'd probably call this, you know, 20 different species. But really we're looking at all the same species when we look at some of the other genetic characters and their ability to interbreed with one another. Another concept that we can use is something called the biological species concept. So this is what we talked about in a previous lecture. And this is essentially whether or not individuals can interbreed and produce viable offspring. So the biological species concept basically says that two different populations do not interbreed in nature or fail to produce viable or fertile offspring, they're considered distinct species. So this is a great concept to use um, in terms of a technical definition for defining different species, um, but it has some really important technical issues that make it difficult to apply, um, especially for asexually reproducing species. Okay, so if you have things like yeasts, bacteria, um, and other species that don't reproduce sexually, so you can't put, you know, a male and a female together and see whether or not they can produce viable offspring if they only produce asexually. Like, for example, yeast just reproduces by budding off little copies of itself. How do you determine whether or not one population can, of yeast can interbreed with another population of yeast if they don't interbreed in the first place? And so this biological species concept doesn't work for asexual species. It also doesn't work for species that are no longer extant. So extinct species or fossilized species. 
So how do you determine if a Velociraptor is different from a Brontosaurus if you can't get a Velociraptor to breed with a Brontosaurus because they no longer exist on planet Earth today? So you need different species concepts to define species that have gone extinct, fossilized organisms. It can also be very difficult to test on living organisms. Um, so, you know, there's an estimated 1.8 million described species and an estimated 10 million species that are out there. We can't get every single one of those species together in a room and see whether or not they're going to breed. So this is not the easiest test to prove in the lab. And you also have to ask questions about what level of hybridization would be enough to no longer consider a species separate, okay? So even if we can interbreed two species, sometimes like for example with ligers where you uh, cross a tiger with a lion, the females are viable in the sense that they can go on to reproduce. So a female liger can go on and reproduce, but male ligers are sterile. They cannot go on to reproduce. So does this cross between or hybrid between a tiger and a lion mean that you have a two different species or the fact that they can produce viable offspring mean that these are not, should not be considered two different species. And so you can get into these sort of gray areas using this biological species concept. And the last concept I wanna talk about is the phylogenetic species concept. So this is the third way that you can go about defining a species. And this is essentially using genetic markers to define populations that have been evolving independently one another over time. So this is looking at DNA sequences or genes or the genetic makeup of an organism and comparing that to the same genes or DNA sequences in another organism and seeing how similar or different they are and using that to try to define how closely related those organisms are and whether we should count them as different species or not. So the idea here is, you know, if you start with a parent population in the past that splits into two populations and has unique genes or alleles accumulating in each of these populations and then let's say population B splits again and also has unique genes and alleles accumulating in these populations such that you get populations A, B, and C in the end, you should be able to make a phylogenetic tree out of those groups of populations based on the relatedness of those organisms. Okay, and you should be able to compare the sort of genetic differences between species B, C, and A and see that one's more closely related to one than it is to another based on sequence differences. And this is what you guys do with DNA barcoding. So I know that you guys are working on your DNA barcoding projects in class, but this is exactly how DNA barcoding works, where you find a region of the genome that exists across a whole bunch of different organisms, and then you sequence the DNA in that piece of the, re, uh, the genome and compare those sequences and see how similar or different they are. And in theory, if you have different species, you should get more or, or fewer differences based on how similar those species are or how closely related those species are. So for example, if I compare two different species of bees, they should have pretty different DNA bar, barcode sequences, but the barcode sequences, if I compare a bee to a bird, should have way more differences in the DNA sequences of a bee versus a bird. And if I compare the same species of bees, those DNA sequences should really not be that different at all. Okay, so really the idea here is you should see fewer differences in closely related species, greater differences in distant related species based on this DNA sequence information. And you can define species if you know how many differences you should see between different versus the same species. So the advantages of using this sort of genetic information or this phylogenetic species concept is you can apply it to sexual, asexual, and fossil organisms. Basically any organism you can get DNA from, you can compare them. You don't need to predict whether the species can successfully hybridize or not. So you don't have to put two organisms in a room together and see if they can produce viable offspring. You just have to see how different their genes are. And it's not easily fooled by cryptic or polymorphic species. Okay, so if you have a bunch of frogs that look really, really different from one another, but if you sequence their DNA sequences and they're very closely related, in theory, if you're using the right DNA sequences, those DNA sequences should match up to show that they're the same species, regardless of what they look like. The issues with this is it's actually very, very, very difficult to figure out the best ways to analyze the DNA and which genes or regions of the genome to use. And you have to make a lot of assumptions about how those uh, 
particular regions of DNA change over time in terms of how mutations accumulate and what they're going to look like. And so, you know, we use DNA barcodes in those DNA sequences and we act like it's very simple. You just kind of amplify those regions and compare them. But it took, you know, 20 or 30 years of research to figure out what are the genes that we need to compare to do DNA barcoding in the first place. What's the best gene regions to use? And you usually have to compare lots of different genes. You can't just barcode one little section to figure out which species are different from one another. And you also have to ask yourself what level, level of genetic difference is enough to say that these are two different species. And that's a very, very, very difficult question to answer. And typically you need other characters to confirm. So it's not just enough to say, okay, this organism has this DNA sequence, this organism has this DNA sequence, and there's five differences between them. So does this mean it's the same species or is it different species? Well, you need to go in and do a bunch of other comparisons between different genes. And oftentimes you have to look at the morphology too. And sometimes you might even have to still put them in a room together and see if they can breed and produce viable offspring. So it's not enough to just look at the genetic differences. So a dry, an important point that I wanna drive home here is that it's not necessarily better to use genetics and DNA than it is to use the morphological or biological species concept. I think a lot of people pull away from this like, oh, DNA is better and it's always better. That's not the case. DNA is just a different tool that can be useful in some scenarios, but by itself, it's not really better or worse than either of those other species concepts. Okay, clicker question. A is the correct answer. So remember the biological species concept means that you have to put two organisms into a room and see if they can interbreed with one another. Okay, so you have, if you have an asexual organism that doesn't have sex to reproduce, so like bacteria and yeasts, they reproduce asexually, they don't have to have sex. You can't put two individuals together and watch them have sex and then see whether or not the offspring are viable or not because they don't reproduce sexually. So the biological species concept is not super useful in this case because it depends on, it relies on using sex and whether or not two organisms reproduce viable offspring. All right, next one. F is the correct answer. Okay. So she's using the morpho species concept because its physical appearance is diff different. She's saying this might be a different species. And then she's also extracting DNA from some tissue that's left in that fossil and seeing how close those DNA sequences are related to closely related species or other DNA samples that she has from the fossil record. And so that's the phylogenetic species concept. So she's using these two concepts. She's not using the biological species concept because she can't interbreed a dead fossil with another living organism. So she's using B and C. Okay, so a couple take homes about species definitions. Number one, there are many. We've talked about three of them. There's also some other definitions we haven't talked about. I'll expect you to know those three though and understand them pretty well. Each has advantages and disadvantages, okay? So one is not necessarily better than another. There's just certain circumstances where one might work better than another. And I'll expect you to understand what those circumstances are similar to the two questions that I just previously asked. Three, none are definitive, okay? So you can't always just use one concept. Um, you want to use multiple definitions multiple lines of evidence to ID a species. That's always better. So if you're actually going to try to define something as a new species, typically you're going to have to use a lot of different resources and a lot of different pieces of evidence if you want to really do that within the scientific community to actually define a brand new species. It's very difficult to do. And the last important point to draw from this is that species are a construct. So when I say a construct, what I mean is it's something that humanity has invented to help us understand nature. But nature itself does not care about what the definition of a species is or how humans define it, okay? It's something that we use to organize things. 
And as we understand species and we look more and more deeply into the definitions and how we define them, we often find that many of the things that we call species don't fit perfectly into these definitions. Okay, so just understand that the more closely and hard you think about these things, the more you'll see that organisms don't always fit perfectly into these constructs. It's just an organizational system that we've devised. Okay, are there any questions about those species concepts or definitions? Then I'm going to move on to talk about how we organize all of these millions of organisms that are out there that we've been talking about and how we do this in a way that's useful to biologists and conservation scientists that want to conserve as many organisms and as much genetic diversity as we can out there and also reflects their evolutionary relationships to one another. So how are all these organisms related to one another? And the way we go about doing that is something called phylogenetic trees. And this is just a picture of a basic phylogenetic tree. So the goals of the next lecture or two are going to be to help you understand how to build and interpret something called a phylogenetic tree, how to distinguish between something called analogous versus homologous traits, and the relationship between taxonomy, so kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, and phylogeny or the actual evolutionary relationships of these organisms. And the idea that taxonomy should reflect phylogeny. What we name things should reflect their evolutionary relationships to one another. So recall from these central ideas of evolution um, that all organisms are descended from a common ancestor. So if we go far enough back in the evolutionary history of any organism, you'll find that it shares a common ancestor with another organism anywhere on the tree of life. And organisms have evolved and diversified through this process of speciation that we've talked about over the last few lectures. And any traits that are held in common by taxonomic groups should be inherited from those common ancestors that they share. So the fact that organisms are made up of cells, and if you look across all different organisms and multicellular organisms, they're gonna share that trait in common because they are evolved from a common ancestor that's also made up of cells. So the way we reflect all of this is through something called a phylogeny. And all this is, is a diagram or a way to depict the process of speciation. So you can think about a population somewhere in the past splitting into two different species and another population splitting somewhere in the past to become two different species. And you can represent that here as a phylogenetic tree that basically says species B and C share a common ancestor and species A, B and C also share a common ancestor somewhere in the past. So a, phyl a phylogenetic tree basically just depicts the speciation process. And it's important to understand that phylogenetic trees are hypotheses. So they are hypotheses describing the relationships of different groups of organisms. Specifically the history of descent of a group of organisms. Okay, so which organisms are more closely related to each other than other organisms in a tree. It assumes that all organisms are related and descendants of a common ancestor. And it's typically built or based on many different clues. So these can be anatomical, aka morphological traits. It can be based on behaviors of different organisms. It can be based on fossil records. It can be based on genetic analyses or DNA sequences. But typically, the more clues you use to build a phylogenetic tree, the better. So how do you read a phylogenetic tree? Typically, when you're looking at a tree, you're moving from the past or ancestral times forward into more recent or derived times. 
You've got different parts of a tree, including the root, which is down here. You've got tips up here. And then you've got branches that make up the tree. So like all of these things are considered branches, all the little blue parts. And the ends of the tree are the tips. And then you add taxa on as leaves on the tips of the branches. And these taxa don't have to necessarily be a species. These could be any sort of taxonomic level. So these could represent domains, they could represent phyla, they could represent, in this case, classes of organisms like fish, birds, and mammals. And then you also have nodes. And all that nodes are are the branch points that represent a common ancestor of all these different taxonomic groups. So for example, this node right here represents the common ancestor of fish, birds, and mammals. Whereas this node or branch point right here where it splits into two different branches, this node represents the common ancestor of birds and mammals, but not fish. And what this phylogenetic tree is essentially telling us is that because birds and mammals share a more recent common ancestor in time than birds and mammals do with fish, they share an older common ancestor further back on the phylogenetic tree. Birds and mammals are more closely related to each other than they are to fish. That's what that tree is telling us. And it's important to understand on any phylogenetic tree that nodes can rotate. So for example, this hypothesis or phylogenetic tree says birds and mammals are more closely related to each other than they are to fish because they share a more closely or a more recent common ancestor. And you can flip that 180 where basically the mammal pops up here, the bird pops up or ends up down here because it's flipped, but this still says literally the exact same thing. It says that birds and mammals share a more recent common ancestor and are more closely related to each other than they are to fish or you can note, rotate it at this node here so that fish pops down at the bottom. And now you've got mammals and birds up here. Birds and mammals are still more closely related to each other and share a more, more recent common ancestor with each other than they do with fish. So all of these phylogenetic trees are equal to each other. They're the same thing. And so you can think about it kind of like a, uh, what's the word for these things? Somebody help me out. A mobile. A mobile, exactly. It's like a mobile that you put above a kid's bed. So these things can spin around and they're always going to say sort of like the same thing or be set up in the same way. All right. Poll question. The correct answer is B. So first, which two species are most closely related? B and A or B and D? The answer to this first part is B and D are most closely related to one another. And that's because B and T or B and D share the most recent common ancestor. So this is basically like if we go back the tree, we can see that this is like the parents, think about it, these are the grandparents and these are like the great grandparents. And so they share grandparents in common, whereas B and A have great grandparents in common, okay? So even though B is next to A here on the tree, they share, B and D share a more recent common ancestor than B and A do. And so B and D are more closely related to each other than B and A are. And then the second part is which species share a common ancestor with B? And the answer is A, C, and D all share a common ancestor with B. It's just how recent is that common ancestor, okay? So C and D share a more recent common ancestor with B, which is right here at this node. And A, C, and D also share a common ancestor with B. It's just that it's less recent in time. It's further back in time. But all organisms on the tree of life, if you go far enough back on that tree, are going to share a common ancestor somewhere. It just depends how far back you go.
Okay. So how to build a phylogenetic tree. So characteristics are placed on the branches based on where they first appeared, and then they carry on up the tree. So for example, if I had a characteristic only of fish, we can call it like a swim bladder or something like that. That character appeared here, evolutionarily speaking, and then carried on up the tree such that all fish have that character. And let's say feathers are a character that are unique to birds. It evolved here and carried on up the tree such that all birds have it. And character like hair could be something unique to mammals that evolved here and carried on up the tree. So that all mammals have that tree. And typically, a characteristic of all three would not be placed on three separate branches like here, here, and here, but it'd be placed further back behind a common ancestor. So for example, if you had a characteristic that all three of these things shared, you'd place it here and then it would carry on up the tree such that it only evolved once and all three of those groups inherited that character from their common ancestor. So that trait gets passed on down through the generations. And more recent traits are called derived traits. So when we say more recent, more recently appeared in time, evolutionary time scales, these are considered derived traits. And older traits are called ancestral traits. So ones that are passed down from the ancestors. Ancestral versus derived. Okay. So if I had a trait right here, where this one just popped up right here, would that be considered an ancestral or derived trait? The correct answer for this one is in fact, both. So C is the correct answer here. So this is an ancestral trait relative to birds and mammals, because it's a trait that their shared ancestor has but it's a derived trait for fish because the common ancestor of fish, birds, and mammals does not have that trait. So whether or not, hi kitty. Sorry, uh, a cat just part popped up on Martina's window. Very cute. <laughs> um, right. So this is a derived trait relative to fish. So whether it's ancestral derived really depends where you are on the tree and what group you're defining it relative to. Okay, so given that, which is a better placement of backbone? Would you put backbone here where it pops up three times or would you put backbone here given that all three of these organisms or groups have a backbone? A is the correct answer. And the reason for this is basically, if you're putting backbone on here three times, you're suggesting that it evolved three times separately on its own, whereas it makes way more sense and it's way less work sort of evolutionarily speaking to have backbone be a shared trait that was derived in a common ancestor of all these organisms and then carried on up the tree rather than evolved three separate times in each of these groups. That's not to say that it's impossible, but it's much more likely that you put backbone here. And so backbone is what's considered a homologous trait. So a homologous trait is a trait that's shared by two or more taxa that was inherited from a common ancestor. So for example, a backbone is an example of homologous trait that's shared by all these vertebrate organisms that they inherited from their common ancestor. And lungs would be an example of a trait or a homologous trait for birds and mammals in that they had a common ancestor with lungs that they inherited that trait from. Homologous traits, you may also see these occasionally called something called a cinepomorphy. And a cinepomorphy is just a specific type of homologous trait in that it's derived for a group. So it's a derived trait shared by two or more taxa. So for example, lungs would be a cinepomorphy that defines this group here, these lunged organisms. It's a derived trait that's shared by two or more taxa.
Now, that being said, sometimes similar traits do evolve independently such that they appear twice on a tree. These are called analogous traits, or they're sometimes called homoplasies. So analogous traits are shared traits that are not from a common ancestor. So the sort of classic example of this would be wings in birds and wings in bats. So in both birds and bats, obviously they have wings, but if you looked at the common ancestor of birds and bats, which would be represented by this node here, that common ancestor probably looked something sort of like this. It was basically like a lizard dinosaur looking type thing that clearly does not have wings. And so the idea here is that birds and bats both independently evolved wings because it helped them survive in their particular environment. And so in this case, those two traits or the traits of wings evolved separately on their own. Thus, they need to be placed twice on the trees. And this is a process called convergent evolution. So convergent evolution just means similar adaptations that evolve independently of one another. So for example, the bird's wings and the bat's wings evolved separately, but they converged or evolution converged on the same form or the same shape. It converged on this idea of wings, but it did it independently two times. And we see examples of convergent evolution happening throughout nature when you have similar selective pressures. So for example, echolocation we've seen evolve for organisms that survive in the dark in lots of different places. So these things called oil birds that live in caves, they can echolocate just like bats can. And also sperm whales, they're also capable of echolocation. And all of these organisms had to figure out or evolve a way to be able to survive in the dark and be able to see without light around. And so echolocation, they all independently evolved the ability to do that. Wings is another thing that we see evolve constantly or many, many times throughout nature. So we see gliding, uh, gliding flying squirrels, gliding monkeys, gliding snakes, flying insects, gliding lizards, butterflies. This is a flying fish. We even see gliding octopi or squids that can jump out of the water. And in all of these cases, it helps these organisms to move around, escape predators. There's obvious evolutionary implications that improve the ability of these organisms to survive and reproduce. And so we see wings evolving over and over and over again throughout nature. Another example that we see is something called succulents. So if you look at this plant down here, this is something called a euphorb. It looks like a cactus. It's actually not a cactus. The one on the right is a cactus. And so these are two different sort of groups of plants. One is cactaceae, the other is euphorbiaceae. They're two different families, but we see the succulent form evolving multiple times in these two different groups of plants because they've evolved to survive in the deserts where there's not a lot of water around. And this succulence allows them to retain water in that dry environment. So these are all examples of analogous traits that have evolved by convergent evolution. Okay, so so what? Why is any of this important? So remember that phylogenies are hypotheses about the evolutionary relationships of organisms. And the goal is always to have the most accurate tree or the best supported hypothesis. And you can actually come up with different hypotheses. So for example, if we go back to that example, where we're looking at birds and humans and fish, you can get one, two, three different examples, or I'm sorry, different hypotheses for the relationships. This one says birds and humans are most closely related. This one says fish and birds are most closely related. And this one says fish and humans are most closely related. So the question is, which of those hypotheses are correct? How do we begin to figure that out? And the way you do that is through this principle called parsimony. So the best tree is the one that's the most parsimonious. So parsimony basically says the fewer times a trait has to arise, the better. So we've got our three different hypotheses, one, two, and three. 
And we figure out that these are the three most important traits that we need to know about these organisms to know their evolutionary relationships to one another. That's a very, very difficult thing to do, but I'm just sort of giving it to you and saying, these are the three traits that we need to look at to know the evolutionary relationships of these organisms. And so I can put these traits on the tree here. So they all share a backbone. Oops. Here, so birds and mammals both have four appendages. And here where mammals, that's a trait, hair is a trait that's unique to mammals. And so I had to put a total of four traits on there to make this tree work. So if I do the same thing for the second hypothesis, they all have a backbone, four appendages there and there, fish doesn't have four appendages, hair there. Once again, you need four, one, two, three, four times, four different times those traits to evolve to make this tree work. So let's look at the last tree. Backbone goes there. Four appendages only has to go here and then it carries on up the tree to both birds and mammals. And then you put hair on. And so this one, only three traits had to evolve or traits only had to evolve three times. And so this is considered the most parsimonious tree and the best supported hypothesis because evolution is doing less work to make that work.